a great cry to the core of the earth. The ocean is howling beyond the wildest mirth, a voice of a million giants long dead, shaking the foundations, moving with dread. The ocean has found his voice tonight, and the earth is sinking out of sight. Water a hundred miles in height. The ocean has found his voice tonight. James Purdy, the celebrated American writer, reading one of his poems from The Collected Poems of James Purdy, just published in Holland by Athenaeum, Polak and Van Gennep, and published for the first time ever complete. Mr. Purdy is in the strange position of being a stranger in his own land. Although he has written 14 novels, a number of plays and many poems, even today he has difficulty getting his work published in the United States. His latest book, Garments, The Living Wear, was published first in England by Peter Owen and has just been published in Dutch and will later appear in French, German, Spanish and as many as 15 or 16 languages. Yet it was still a problem obtaining an American publisher. Well, it's still difficult to be published in the United States. My uh, last book was turned down by ten New York publishers. It was finally published by City Lights in San Francisco. But it had been first published in England by Peter Owen. Critics there called your work difficult, with a hidden, convoluted style, and sometimes with unsavory subject matter. Unsavory in what way, did they mean? Not bourgeois. Not sufficiently bourgeois? No. <laughs> However, British and European critics explained this... Um, early U.S. reticence in recognizing the value of your work as being against the traditional values in the United States. Uh, people often didn't understand your humor and sometimes your sometimes bizarre wit. Apparently outside the United States, though, we do, or at least here in Holland we seem to. We seem to. I seem to have very fine audience here. In fact, one of your books, was it The Nephew or Narrow Rooms, was withdrawn by your U.S. publisher because a critic referred to it as obscene in America? Yes, it was condemned by the New York Times and the literary establishment. Which book was that? Narrow Rooms. Mm -hmm. wow. And yet that had been reviewed, widely reviewed overseas and considered a great book. Yes, it still is. Quentin Crisp, in an, I think, brilliant appreciation of your work, said that the theme of much of your work is, and I quote him, the overwhelming need to reach up from squalor, which is a word that Mr. Crisp rather likes, uh, or depravity, uh, to something or someone higher, richer, more beautiful than oneself. Is that a fair assessment, would you it's say? very good, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, excellent. He said also that most of your heroes are losers. Well, I think so. I base everything on people I know, and New York is the cavern of losers. <laughs> <laughs> you often write in the first person. Why, is this a, a favorite device? <clears throat> well, for a long time, I thought that was the one method I could never use because the people I write about in the first person are never me. But gradually, I found that was the most comfortable way of writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I have several books that are novels that are all in the first person, such as um, In a Shallow Grave mm -hmm. and I Am Elijah Thrush, that are the whole book is like, we forget that Moby Dick is written entirely in the first person. You have a, a, a remarkable understanding and affinity with your women characters, I find, uh, and you can write convincingly from a woman's perspective. I think of uh, Unglory's Course and the nephew in particular. Right. It's very true. Is it difficult to do that? No, I don't think so. I grew up in a family of matriarchs. I even knew my great-grandmother, and they were inveterate storytellers. So I think I absorbed a lot of that from them. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid I, I've, I only know your plays from the text, unfortunately, I've not seen one staged, but are they widely staged today? Yes, in Canada especially, mm -hmm. but also in New York off-Broadway. They just completed plays at the Theatre for the New City, and they also had the plays a year ago. Mm -hmm. They're done uh, all over New York City, but they're almost never reviewed because they're considered uh, beneath the notice of the establishment. So you continue to have this problem with the critics? Oh, yes. Even with the international success that you have? Well, New York doesn't know any city but New York. It's the most parochial city in the world and the one least connected with the American language. That's why they don't understand my books, because no one in New York really speaks English. 
Not even the cab drivers? No, especially. <laughs> but I can forgive them. <laughs> Uh, some of your stories seem ideal vehicles for the cinema, and I believe one recently has been filmed. Uh, yes. In fact, two. Uh, one was filmed based on In a Shallow Grave, but another was based on one of the short stories in The Candles of Your Eyes mm -hmm. called Sleep Tight, about a five-year-old boy and a black robber. Are there any future plans for any of the others yet? Well, a Dutch company has... Uh, contracted for in the hollow of his hand. I suppose they will film it in Holland. I don't know. I find your poetry particularly sensitive. Is it something very special for you? Yes. Uh, again, uh, as in everything in the United States, I couldn't find a publisher for my poems. But over the years, uh, I discovered that composers were setting them to music. So I thought they really should be published to protect them. So I published the first book of poems myself, The Running Sun. But now um, Mr. Tinbas has published them complete, the complete poems, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in English, not in Dutch. And uh, your fame spreads wider and wider. Now an opera in Munich in Germany. Right, 63 Dream Palace, a short novel, is, has been set to music, uh, an opera, by Hans Jürgen von Bosa, in, uh, to be given its world premiere in May of this year in Munich. What sort of influences shaped your writing career? Well, I was brought up in a Calvinist family, and we had to read the Bible from cover to cover and memorize a great deal of it. I think that had a deep influence on me, uh, the King James Version, not mm -hmm. the modern versions. And what about writers? Who, who, were you influenced by anyone in particular? Well, we were... Uh, made to read Shakespeare from cover to cover also. And um, among American writers, well, I think Walt Whitman had the most influence on me. Then there were writers like Ernest Hemingway's stories and Sherwood Anderson's stories. I think those had a deep influence on the way one writes short stories. What about the European classics? Well, I uh, am a great admirer of Flaubert and Balzac. And uh, I think I was somewhat influenced by Dickens in his use of uh, character. I can't think of a contemporary writer more widely praised by your peers. Uh, you've been called many times a writer's writer. People like Albie, Bowes, Vidal, uh, Williams, even Dame Edith uh, Sitwell. You must yeah. find this immensely satisfying, though. This kind well, of I was especially uh, overwhelmed by Dame Edith Sitwell because... I sent her the private editions of my books, never thinking she would even find them. And it was she who got me officially published in England. Without her, I don't think I would have ever been published. Also, it was praised by John Cooper Poas. Uh, he was the first writer to call me a genius, which I found uh, hard to believe because I had been so uh, crucified <laughs> by the New York publishers, I still am, of course, burned at the stake every few years. So I found these two appraisals of my work uh, almost impossible to believe. Part of the reason for your visit to the Netherlands is the Dutch translation of your most recent book, Garments, The Living Wear. Uh, this was published, I think you said, by... Peter City Lights. In, uh, oh, no, first by Peter Owen mm -hmm. in England, because no one in New York would touch it. They said it was a subversive, disgraceful work unworthy of an American writer. Uh, Viking, Weidenfeld and Nicholson, uh, Alfred Knopf, you can go right down the list of uh, these pious people. James Purdy, author of such works as Malcolm, The Nephew, Eustace Chisholm and the Works, In a Shallow Grave, On Glory's Course, and In the Hollow of His Hand, whose latest book, Garments, The Living Wear, is published in London by Peter Owen, by City Lights in San Francisco, and in Dutch translation by Athenaeum, Polak and van Gennep and Kretak here in Holland. His collected poems have just been published complete for the first time in English by the Athenaeum Press and will appear later also in Dutch. Here he reads a second selection from his collected poems. This poem is from Lessons and Complaints. The lesson has been presented and the master is in the hall. She heard the first notes 
flying overhead and held her breast. It was the song only an angel could pour out. The master was looking at her. She opened her mouth. Her lips trembled, and her teeth appeared to fall to the floor like genuine pearls. A spider spun a web over her right eye. A mouse scurried at her feet. The master looked again. His great baton rose over her snow-white throat. The tongue behind her falling teeth raised. The great note rushed out into the church. The congregation shuddered. The walls of the church moved. The tapestries, which had waited for so many decades, stricken with the sound, moved into warm life. Steeds, shepherds, sheep. Jesus smiled, and sunlight as gold as the gates of heaven flooded all eyes. Mr. James Purdy, you're tuned to Holland to Images, our weekly arts magazine.